see something. You know the story about how that Jesus was actually, uh, or Mary and Mar uh, excuse me, I'll get this right. Mary and Joseph were uh, actually out of town when Jesus was born. They were not in their hometown. They were in Bethlehem. The Bible tells us that they were there because of taxation, the need to, to register and so forth. And uh, that's the way they did it in those days. But the Bible says that, that sh they got to this place, the inn, where actually the, uh, where, where Jesus was born, and there was no more rooms. You can imagine they were late because you, you can imagine Mary wasn't walking that fast or, or the donkey wasn't going that fast if she was riding a donkey or whatever. I mean, slow down, Joseph, slow down. Every bump makes him want to come, you know. So that's probably why they were late and they weren't there in time to get a room. But uh, the, th that night, Jesus was born. They tell us that the, the way the, we, they didn't call them hotels, but we'll call it a hotel, was that day, in those days. It was like a square uh, building around with a, with a center area in the middle. And that's where the, you know, the oxen or the whatever, the horses or mules or whatever that people had traveled with were kept. And so, and the, and the place was actually, the way they said it was, was, was made, most of the time they, the walls on the interior were not there. I mean, the people in that room could see, and every, everybody's probably watching this birth. I mean, who knows? But the point is, is that it says here in uh, the 27th verse, it, it, it came to, uh, let's see here, Luke chapter 2, why am I, oh, verse 7, I'm sorry, that's why. It says that she brought forth her firstborn son, Jesus, of course, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. A manger is a, a cattle feed trough <laughs> because that's where they were. They were there in the, amongst the cattle because there was no room for them. Now, you realize that if people maybe had realized that this was the Christ child being born, somebody probably would have given up the room, but they probably didn't even realize it, you know? Uh, Anyway, the fact that there's a lady out there giving birth, I think somebody should have given up their room. How many of you think maybe? But anyway, that being the case, they, uh, they, they, this child was born. Jesus was born there in the uh, area where the cattle were staying, and Jesus was laid in a manger. And it says, because there was no room for them in the inn. No room for them in the inn. I want to talk to you this morning about making room for God, making room for Jesus in your life. How many of you know He won't barge in? He won't kick the door in. He's a perfect gentleman, and He waits to be invited into our lives. And so they gave Jesus, or I should say um, Mary gave birth to Jesus there in the stable because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, um, other translations in the Amplified brings it out, no place. Uh, the Lord, is He waits for us to give Him place in our life. The church world for too long has said things like, God is sovereign and He's controlling everything and running everything. And they lay everything that happens off on Him or everything that should have happened that they wanted to happen that didn't happen off on Him and accuse God of being the one who, uh, for some reason or another, is not uh, doing what they think. And the church has been putting everything that happens off on God. You know what I'm talking about. But we've got to wake up to the fact is that God has given man authority to choose whether he is in their life or not. Amen. He gives man authority to choose whether he has what God has for him or not. Of course, first of all, whether Jesus is even in their lives. But then even if he comes into their life through, through being the Savior, he still gives them choice whether he, they want him to be anything else. Because he will be everything we invite him to be in our lives that he said in his word that he wants to be for us. Because God gave man authority in his life to choose whether God gets his way in each of the circumstances of his life, things don't always turn out the way God intended for them to happen in people's lives. And it's not God deciding these things, it's whether they invited him in. 
You understand that? So we can have as much of God as we want. We can have Him in the areas that we want. And we can have Him to the degree that we want. In every area. You understand? How many of you know God is the God of fullness? He's the God of abundance. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. But yet, right on the other hand, He still waits to be invited. I want you to go to the book of Revelation and see something in the... Uh, we'll, we'll start... Well, we'll just read in chapter number 2, I believe. And... Uh, well, I had it marked here. Where did it go? thought I had it right on this page. I'll find it. The book of Revelation says, I believe it's chapter 2. Let me find it. It's the Laodicean church. It says in the, uh, why is it disappearing all of a sudden? It's supposed to be in this page. Right, Revelation 3.20, there it is. Revelation 3, verse number 20. He's talking to the Laodicean church. And he said, not, now, now here's, here's something I want to say before we read this. This is not being written to sinners. Although this is true about sinners. What is, we're getting ready to read. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. We oftentimes hear it preached to sinners. And, and it is, it, that's not wrong to do that. That is true about sinners. The Lord is standing at the door of every man's heart knocking and wanting in. But if you read the whole context, he's writing this actually to his people. And he said, verse 20, I, I, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Jesus is dictating this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Do you hear the children saying, Open up your door. You want them to come up and say it again? <laughs> they got their point across, didn't they? Open up your door. So he's talking even to believers. Does that, does that register with you that there are, thing, there are more things that he wants to do in our lives, even as believers, that maybe we don't have the door open to him in? Somebody said, well, he's God. He can do anything he wants. Well, apparently he's too much of a gentleman to barge in. Amen. According to these verses. And so we can have as much of God as we want, but it requires us to make room for Him in our thinking, in our believing, in our receiving, in our talking. Amen. 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 Now, the Bible says in Psalm chapter number, and we won't go there. I think most of us know this. Psalm 78, verses, uh, verse 78, verse number 41, it says, They turn back, talking about the children of Israel in the Old Testament, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. These are God's people, and it says God, it's telling us God wanted to do something more in their lives and go further with them and come more into their lives and do more than He was doing, but it says they limited Him. Now, that's a concept many, many Christians don't have from the Bible, but we're going to show it to you over and over and over again. You can go to, we won't go there, but Luke 6, you could go and look at it, and you see Jesus in his own hometown was limited in what he could do. It says he could there do no mighty work, save he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And it tells us exactly what limited him. It went further to say he marveled because of their unbelief. So this is a faith issue when we are talking about opening up and letting God do greater things in our lives. Are you still with me this morning? Now, uh, the Bible tells us plainly, I want you to go over to another passage in Psalm 80, 81. Psalm 81, this is the main text this morning. Those other ones were all free. <laughs> you with me this morning? Hear this with your heart. Hear this with, what's, with the, heart, the, the Spirit of God talking to your heart. Because there's areas in all of our life that He wants to do more in. It says in Psalm 81, this verse is a huge challenge to me. Psalm 81, look at verse number 10. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Oh, my goodness. 
Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. <laughs> Amen. Open, i got to say that again. Say that out loud with me. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. God's talking. Say it again. God's saying to all of us, what's he saying? Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Does that sound like he's saying, I will fill it to the degree you open it? What if we open it narrow? He'll fill it. Narrow. <laughs> Can you see this is more up to us than God? Somebody said, well, isn't God doing something? Yeah, he's doing the filling, but he's limited by how far we open up. I've seen parents trying to feed a baby that didn't want to take it in. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, and you're not a baby, but I'll just and and yeah. You know, mm, mm, can't can't get it in, right? And so God's I, this to me. <laughs> this is this is God inviting us to open up big. Because he didn't say open it up small, open it up narrow. Open big, and I'll put in there as much as you open up. You ever read the Bible? It says he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Then he said this, according to the power that works in us. That's us right there. That's the limiting factor, how much we put the power of God to action. Into, into action. So this is an invitation to us. And to me, it's more than an invitation. It's a challenge. Now, the mouth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what this actually means in the Hebrew. The word wide in the Hebrew is translated in Genesis 26, 22. The same word is translated make room. Make room. There was no room for him in the end. They didn't open up. Somebody didn't give him a room. And so he wasn't in there, in, in the inn. He was out in the stable. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. He's waiting to be invited and for someone to open up and let him into their room. And the literal Hebrew here, when it says, open your mouth wide, the word wide is in Genesis 26, 22, translated, make room. Amen. It's also in Exodus 34 to 24 translated, enlarge your borders. <laughs> Amen. The reason God is not in our lives more or doing more is because we have too narrow of borders. We're too small in our capacity to receive. I didn't say you. I said we. All of us have limiters on God. <laughs> he's, he's longing to do so many things. I'll never forget Brother Hagin said one time that he and actually Miss Aretha had developed, I believe this is the time she had developed a goiter on her throat, on her throat right here. And uh, he and Miss Aretha never talked about it, but they... At the, at, right at the time that I'm talking about. They had never talked about it, but they both knew that if she went to the hospital and had it operated on, she would die on the operating table. They knew that by the inner witness. They knew that by the Spirit. That doesn't mean it was God's will. They just both knew that's not a good option for this situation. They talked later and discovered that both of them knew it, but uh, they had not talked at first until Brother Hagen, she's, she's waking up in the nighttime with these choking spells and choking fits. And, uh, and Brother Hagin started pleading her case. And ask, he, said, he said to the Lord, Lord, I know you've been, you've been talking to my heart that if we have her operated on, not that the God's against an operation, just things were going to go wrong, in other words. And so he said, but I'm asking you to spare her life. I need her. You gave her to me as a wife. I need her, and so forth. He's pleading her case. And he asked the Lord to spare her life and to... to uh, to uh, intervene in what was going to happen on the operating table. And the Lord said, I'll, I'll do it just because you asked me. Yes, sir. Tell her to go have it operated on and she'll live and uh, she will not die. 
and just because you asked me. And he said, then the Lord's, and then she had it operated on, and, and it was fine. And, and she, of course, uh, you know, didn't die on the operating table. But the Lord said to Brother Hagin in that prayer time, he said, I'm going to do it just because you asked me. He said, you were right. She was going to die on the operating table. It, wasn't, it doesn't mean it was God's will. He was just telling her, telling them what was going to happen. And under the present circumstances. But because Brother Hagin asked him, the Lord said, I'll do it. I'll spare her life just because you asked me. And then he said this. He said, I long to do so much for my children, but they don't ask me. Get that. They don't ask me. In other words, where's the limiter here? Is it on God's side? No, it's on our side. Can you see that? Do you see it with your heart, or you just see it because I'm preaching it? It's, it's real to me sometimes about uh, what I'm preaching. Now, um, it says here, make room. I mean, open your mouth wide means make room. Say make room. Make room. So it's translated make room. It's also translated enlarge your borders. It requires us to make room in our thinking, believing, and talking for God to be able to do more. Now, the mouth, when he says, open your mouth wide, I'll fill it. The mouth is the instrument of speech. <clears throat> Amen. But uh, besides the literal meaning, the term mouth in this verse is used figuratively, figuratively for the words themselves that a man speaks. Now, the word is translated, the word mouth is translated. Just hold on with me a few minutes and let me humor me with a few definitions so we can understand this better. In the Hebrew, the word mouth is literally translated edge in the Old Testament. What, Pastor? Listen up. It means it's translated from edge to edge as in measurement. It's translated from one end to the other meaning full to the limit. You listening? Depending on the, pri on the capacity of a particular container. In the book of Ezra 9, verse number 11, it says, The land unto which you go to possess it is an unclean land with the f filthiness of the people of the land, with their abominations, which have filled, listen, filled it from one end to the other with their uncleanness. Filled it from one end to the other. That's the same. That, that filled it from one end to the other is the same Hebrew word in the Hebrew translated mouth in Psalm 81, verse number 10. Okay, hold on. You might be saying, I don't get it yet. Hold on. Are you listening? Take, take, have ears to hear this morning. And so when it says from one end to the other, it's talking about from edge to edge, border to border, limit to limit. In other words, the whole land. Not just one city. Not just one town. Come on, come on. Not just one mountain with a grove to an idol. The whole land was full of all kinds of wickedness, idol worship, perversions of all kinds. From edge to edge. From one end to the other. In other words, it was full. You getting it? And he's saying that in, in Psalm 81... Actually, both Psalm 81, Psalm 78, verse 41, he said uh, they limited the Holy One of Israel. He's saying that the limiting factor is not on God's side, but on the, on the side of man's faith. So when he said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it, let's, let's put these definitions. In other words, I will, uh, wide means, do you remember what wide means? What does wide mean? Make room. Make room. Open your, open your mouth, and I'll fill it edge to edge. Yeah. 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 Wherever the limits are of how open your mouth is, yeah. that's how much room I have to move in your life. You, you speak out to this limit, I'll meet you out at that limit. You, you enlarge your capacity to believe to a certain limit and speak to a certain limit, that's the limit of how far I can go in your life. What he's saying is, don't let natural things limit how far you speak. 
He's saying your speaking needs to go beyond the limits of the natural. Amen. How many of you know there's a lot of different things you can put voice to? You can put voice to a doctor's report. You can put voice to what you feel. You can put voice to uh, the, the limits of your education. Huh? You can put voice to your past experiences. This is the way it's always been, so it'll never be anything different. And God said, that's as far as I can go. You keep talking about, it's always been this way. This is my experience. Uh, you know, this is my education. God's saying, I'll feel you to the limit of that, but I can't go beyond what you're saying. It's time that we take the limits off of God by taking the limits off of what we say. This is a challenge to talk big. <laughs> talk big about Him and what He will do. Isn't that what He's challenging us to do? To stir ourselves up and walk by faith and move beyond where we've been, where we've been speaking. He's saying, if you talk big about me, I'll get in that big talk. He said, you talk big, and I'll fill those words with my power edge to edge. Yes. Amen. Don't let your mind narrow your mouth. He didn't, he didn't say, open your mouth to the degree of you can figure it out. If that's your limiter, that's as far as God can go to the degree you can figure it out. I speak beyond what my mind can figure out over and over and over again. Yes, Amen. There's a passage of Scripture. I don't know if you've ever read this or not. It's uh, in Ezekiel. The Bible talks about, and let me find it here. i got so many things written down. The Bible talks about in Ezekiel. Remember that vision that Ezekiel had where there was a river flowing out of the, the house of God? And the Bible says in Ezekiel 47, 3 through 5, that, that he measured out. And uh, the river was, at the, at the edge, it was ankle deep. Then it was out further, 1,000 cubits further, it was knee deep. 1,000 cubits further, it was waist deep. And then out beyond that 1,000 cubits, it was water swimming. You couldn't touch the bottom. He's talking about the river of God flowing out of the presence of God. And so... I think that's been the, 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 the example there of measuring out and then the angel coming back and then taking him out. To me, there's a lot of different ways you could look at that. That measuring, we could look at that as the measure of our faith. The measure of our talking. This has been my life. I go out somewhere with my words. And start talking out in a place that I am not in my natural experience. Based on something God has spoken to me from His Word. You understand what I'm talking about? And as I begin to say it, declaring what God said, somebody said, you, are, you, are you saying God will do what you say? Yeah, if you'll say what He said, then He'll do what you'll say. <laughs> say what He said, He'll do what you say. Yeah, you didn't get that. Let me go over here. Let me see if they get it over here. If you and I will say what he said, he'll do what he said. Let's say it even more accurately according to the Bible. If we'll say what he said, he'll do what we say. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because we're saying what he said. If he didn't want us to do it, if he didn't want us to have it, he shouldn't have said it. But see, he does want us to have it. That's why he says some things. And so the way we measure out is we go out there with our faith and with our words. And we begin to declare the promises of God. Declare the rights and privileges we have in Christ. And when we do that, we're measuring out. And the, the angels go out there and they fix some things and then they come back and they say, come, come, come. And they walk us into what we've been saying. It's been the story of my life. It's been the story of my life. You've watched us. You've watched us. Here's an example. You've watched us. We've said, somebody's going to give the church a one-time gift, cash, check, or money order into the general fund, $10,000. Yeah. 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 
we had a lot of people look at us gawking like, really? I'm going to sit and watch this, see if this works. Boom, there it was, $10,000. Somebody's going to give us one-time gift, cash, check, or money order into the general fund. Uh -huh, I mean, excuse me, $25,000. We had some more people watching to see if it was going to work. Boom, there it hit. Somebody's going to give the church one-time gift, cash, check, or money, $50,000, money order, $50,000 into the general fund. More people were even more, a little more expected now this time. Boom, there it hit. Somebody's going to give this church a one-time gift, cash, check, or money order, $100,000 into the general fund. People were kind of excited this time. Watch that. Watch it. Watch. Pastor's been doing that, and it's been working. Boom, there it hit. Now we're saying somebody's going to give the church a one-time gift, cash, check, or money order into the general fund, $250,000. Oh, you know that isn't going to happen. No, not for you. Not for you. Don't, don't ever expect it to happen for you. Too narrow. Well, I don't know if that'll work for me. I mean, that works for churches. God didn't say you'll have what you say if you're a pastor of a church. Amen. Amen. You heard us start to say, we're going to pay this building off. You know, when I go home and think, when I, if I got to in my mind thinking about it, I'm like, oh, my goodness, that's a big bite. But we just kept on saying it when our head was going, no, no don't say that, don't say that. Don't say, we just kept on saying it, just kept on saying it. See, we measured out, and now guess what? Here we are being taken right into it. <laughs> say Measure. It's according to our faith. Your words are God's prelude. They go before Him and, and they front what He's about to do. If you want God to take you to the next level in an area of His will, go there with your words. And then your words will take you and God right into it. Someone said, God? Yeah. Yeah. That's how he gets into an area of your life. He, by your words, inviting him into it. Amen. Making room. <laughs> the Lord said to me, and I was meditating on this, he said, if you can launch out into the deep with your confession, God can fill your boat with what's out there. <laughs> the big fish out there. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Some of you are looking at me kind of funny. Thank God for the Word. Let's get the limit off of God. There are a lot of different people that don't understand what I'm talking about. They have been taught the sovereignty of God to the point to where they just think, you know, God's controlling all these things. But He's not. I said He's not. There are so many verses we could look at. I could, I could preach on four. Just the notes I have in front of me, I could preach for four hours. I'm not saying I will. but I'm just saying just over and over verses, over and over that, that say these very things. And so would you accept God's invitation? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is the challenge for you in 2020. Measure out further. Measure out further. Go on out. Launch out with, with your words. Launch out with saying things that defy what natural realities say can happen. And don't quit. Don't quit. Hallelujah. Now, so uh, Psalm, Psalm 81 is saying, Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. Border to border. Make room. I'll fill whatever measure you give me to fill. I'll fill the words that you speak and, and to the degree that you speak. Sounds strange to people that have never been really New Testament taught. They've been taught the sovereignty of God. Uh, God does have a sovereign will for all His children, but it's, uh, it's our words that take us into it. Are you, are you understanding what I'm talking about? I don't know. Um, when, when confession gives you access to the things of God, or it holds you out. Now notice, don't misunderstand me, you already have ownership of everything Jesus said in His Word. He redeemed you from and bought and paid for you in redemption. 
you already have ownership. When I say confession uh, gives you access into the things of God, I didn't say gives you ownership. Jesus gave you ownership of everything that, that he purchased with his blood whenever he died on the cross. That gave you ownership of them. But it was your confession of, of salvation that even moved you into salvation. That's how you entered into it. How do you enter into salvation? You believe in your heart on the Lord Jesus and confess with your mouth that he's Lord. Salvation belonged to you before you did that, but when you did that, you entered into salvation. And so what I'm saying is confession gives you access to the things of God, or it can hold you out of the things of God. It doesn't give you ownership, but it gives you access to what, you already right, what, what is already rightfully yours. You understand that? You understand the difference? So he's already given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, so we already have ownership of them. But confession is your way to get into it. It's your way to enter into what God has provided. Sometimes uh, we need to understand that confession is transportation in the spirit realm. If you want to go somewhere, confess it and speak it. Amen. And you'll go there. Sometimes the only available transportation into things is a confession of faith. No other way. No other way. The Bible says whenever we speak concerning salvation, receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord, it says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Notice that unto. How do you get into or uh, in the place where you're, you're at salvation? By believing it and saying it. That's how you got into it. In other words, there's a way that God will take us into things, and it's by believing and saying. And that's the way He gets us into everything. Sometimes the only available transportation is just a leap of faith. It's just a confession of faith and a continuation of that confession. And don't quit. Yes. Amen. 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 That's how you enter into salvation. That's how you get into everything. God's already given you and I authority in our lives, in our own lives, to have what we want to have. And what we say is choosing what we want. Actually, when we say, speak His blessings, God then knows what we want. Amen. His blessings and His plan, uh, or what the devil offers, is in our mouth. Whether we have His blessings, His plan, or what the devil offers, is in our mouth. I said it's in our mouth. Say amen. amen. Don't let your mind narrow your mouth. Don't let your past narrow your mouth. Don't let small thinking narrow your mouth. Don't let the small thinking of other people narrow your mouth. Don't let the way people, don't let what Iowa thinks is big narrow your mentality and narrow your mouth. Amen. amen. If you uh, think like other people think, uh, then uh, it, you're limited by what they think. Amen? Whatever is forming their mentality is going to limit you if you think like they think. You have to get your eyes on something other than whatever's forming their mentality if you're going to have something more than they have. Amen? We got to we got to launch out into the deep. Go out where impossibilities lie. Go out beyond the doctor's report with your mouth. Don't let that form your 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 speech. Don't let your job uh, limit your talking. Don't let your income limit what your limit how far you go in your talking. Amen. Don't let the economy and for heaven's sake don't let the news media you know the news media talks for the devil a lot of times? They don't talk for God. When was the last time they came on the news and said, we want to tell you about a great big revival over in China or what God's doing in Kenya or this miracle that happened in Cedar Rapids. They're just talking for the devil. Don't, don't let them limit you 
or form your mentality. God alone is to have the honor of forming your thinking and forming your words. Amen? Amen. If a man talks smart, talks against God, God loves him all right, and God has a supply for him beyond what he's talking, but he has cut himself off from better things by his words. There are things that limit God, and, and wrong speaking is one of them. Satan can't limit God. But you can. Amen. By talking wrong and talking small. Everybody's still happy that they came? People make all kinds of excuses why they don't have more. Well, my education, lack of opportunity, nobody gives me a break. You know, lack of education. But those are all circumstances. Maybe, maybe that, that is an element to it, but your words created all those too. Thank you for your enthusiasm. That's all created by words. People say, well, I say that because that's reality. No, that's reality because you say that. We got to get, people get the cart before the horse. Jesus said, you'll have what you say. He didn't say, say what you have. He said, you'll have what you say. Mark 11, 23. Amen. Well, people don't give opportunities because you go around saying that. You're surrounded by opportunities every day. You ever heard what Oral Roberts said? Miracles are passing you by. You're, you're either catching them or they're passing you by every day. How do you catch them? You get your words out there. Thank you, Father. Everywhere I go, I'm highly favored. Thank you, Father. Open, the doors are opened unto me. Opportunities are opened unto me. Praise God. Thank you, Father, that favor encircles me as a shield. Favor ain't fair. Favor gets me through doors that nobody else can get through. We've, we've got so many testimonies, people here, that they're working jobs that people, that they really don't have the education that qualifies them for that position. That position had a, had a uh, re requirements list of what a person that occupied that position had to have. And the education was on there. And, and we've got all kinds of tests. People stand, sitting here right now, they got, they got jobs that they weren't qualified to get into. Why? Because their mouth took them there. Their mouth took them there. I said their mouth took them there. It's with your faith that you get into things that are impossible. You know, a lot of times people say, I just don't have any opportunities. You know that what is happening is when you say that, you blind yourself to the, to the ones that are there. They're there, you just don't see them because of wrong words. Thank you for your, for your enthusiasm. That's the help right there. So, praise the Lord. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it from one side to the other. Make room. So he's talking about limits, isn't he? Now, the, 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 the issue with a lot of people that I meet is they're satisfied. And that's why they don't reach any further. That's why their words don't go any further. Uh, but you need to get a clue that there's more to this than just what you want or you're satisfied with. It's not just about you and what you have. It's about having enough to do what God wants you to do. And that is way beyond where you're satisfied. That is. It is. It is. He'll do you better than you would even do yourself. If you'll open up to Him. Amen. God knows if you're satisfied or not by how big you talk. How, how wide your mouth is open. Amen. I, I don't particularly like the fellowship of people that are satisfied. I like people that think bigger than me and kind of look at me like, are you going to get busy and do the Word? Or are you going to just sit there and... That's the kind of people I like hanging around. Amen. 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 <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They think big. They talk big. David was a stripling of a kid, about 17 years old, and uh, he went out talking big to, to Goliath. And God said, now here's somebody I can use. Those, those, fear, those fear mongers back there shaking in their boots saying, Goliath is, you know, a big guy. and We can't take him. Remember, the whole army of Israel was shaking in their boots for 40 days. Yeah. 
You read it, Psalm, I mean, in uh, 1 Samuel 16, 17. And uh, they, were, they were talking limited because their, the fear that came out of Goliath was limiting their talking. But you've got to learn to talk beyond fear. Talk beyond what your mind can figure out. Talk big. Amen. And talk beyond what you can calculate the cost. Amen. Don't calculate the cost before you open your mouth. He didn't say open your mouth wide and then you'll have to fill it. He said open your mouth wide and I, I will fill it. Now we're beyond what you can do and we're out into what he can do. <laughs> it's not about what you can do. It's about what he can do. The amount of need you create by your wide open mouth means nothing to him. You say that's big. And he said what, what, what do you mean big? Yeah. I created the universe. Yeah. Yeah. I can do exceedingly yeah. abundantly above all you can ask yeah. or think. I just need you to open your mouth big enough. Even though you can't figure it out, open it bigger. Amen. Amen. If your future, you see, your future is in your mouth. And if your future is in your mouth, then if your mouth is small, you'll have nothing different than what you're talking. You'll have nothing different than what you have right now. Can I lovingly challenge those that are called retired? Don't sit on your laurels. Don't sit on where you're at. Reach for some things. Oh, that didn't hit like I intended it to hit. That's because it brought conviction to some of you. And that's fine. I'm here to uh, challenge you to don't be limited by your retirement, be limited by what your investments are able to do. God can do exceedingly, abundantly above all we ask or think. Yes, Hallelujah. 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 We're, we're preparing some things for retirement, but I don't ever intend to retire. I, I can't stop preaching. I just don't want to stop preaching. I'm going to be 85 and say, open your Bible too. Hallelujah. So the amount that need that your wide open mouth creates means nothing to him. It might be big to you, but to him it's not big. Amen. Your future's in your mouth. So if you talk small, your future's going to be small. But God invites you to talk big. Amen. Praise the Lord. And here's something I want to challenge you as a congregation to do. To do. Don't uh, narrow the pastor's mouth. You know what I'm talking about? If we're saying the building is paid off in Jesus' name, don't say, well, I don't know how we can do that. Well, you're watching it happen. <laughs> Amen. Don't narrow our mouth. Take what we say and narrow it down. Well, I can't figure it out. Well, maybe I can't either. But that doesn't limit my speaking. You got to get good. Somebody said, well, I, whenever I start talking the word and start talking things I can't figure out, oh, my mind gets attacked with thoughts of bombarding doubts and fears and all kinds of things. I must be doing something wrong. No, you're doing something right. Finally, you've got out into the area of faith where the devil doesn't like it. That's why he's attacking you. And finally, you've taken the limits off of God out into that area. Amen. Amen. When we talk big, don't try to narrow our mouth. Don't criticize a man who talks bigger than you. He's just possessing to the degree of the largeness inside of him. Just because you're narrow on the inside doesn't mean other people are narrow on the inside. Amen. Amen. Words are limiters. How far you're willing to go with your words determines what God can do for you. And you have to know He longs to do so much more for you. Amen. He delights in it. He has pleasure in the prosperity of His servants. Am I making any sense this morning? 
Psalm uh, 78, 41 says they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And a few verses before that, he talked about how they limited God. Verse 18 and 19, they tempted God in their hearts by asking manna for their lust. Yea, they spake against God. They said, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? See, their talking was against God. That, that reminds you of Malachi 3, doesn't it? Remember, he said, your words are stout against me. And he's talking about limiting. The word stout means to bind or restrain, if you look it up. And so words spoken against God limits God. Someone said, well, I don't believe that. I believe God can do anything. Well, let me kindly and, and lovingly say you believe wrong. According to the Bible. Amen. So let's open up bigger. Three by five talking will never create a 16 by 20 world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're right. You're right. <laughs> Let's talk this big and see if we can get a 16 by... No, it doesn't work that way. doesn't work that way. Can you say amen? amen. They, your words not only limit God, they limit your faith. Your heart is full of faith. Sitting in this church, your heart is full of faith. But, but your words will, will limit your faith. Your words will either bolster or whip the faith that's in your heart. There's enough power in the faith you carry in your heart day to day to, to whip all kinds of things. Cancer, all kinds of stuff. But if your words never go there, your faith is whipped. It can never do anything beyond your words. Your words cause faith to grow in power, and your words cause faith to shrivel if you speak wrong words. The effect of your words on your own heart is amazing. In fact, it is more powerful than other people speaking the word to you. You can school your own spirit into faith by speaking words of faith. There's plenty of things during this house build. Fear will bombard me sometimes. Certain things uh, about how, how, the, how things are going and the extra expense and so forth. And I have to answer those with my words. I will not let that shrink me down small. And before I'm done, I get giddy and fall back to sleep. Amen. Are you out there? Your faith will never register above the words you speak. Oh, I got great faith, Pastor. Well, unless you speak great faith, then your, words, your, your faith will never register above that. It's like a dog on a leash. He can only go so far, you know, and then he's jerked back. Whenever your faith rises up and wants you to say something in your heart and your words don't, don't want to say it, you don't want to say it because, well, ah, that's big, that's big. It's, all of a sudden, you jerk that back. You jerk that back. And, 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 and uh, God wants to do things way beyond what you can do. But don't jerk him back. Amen. You getting it this morning? Yes, sir. Never expect to receive beyond what you confess with your lips. Many people don't believe what I'm preaching because they've embraced the sovereignty of God doctrine. But the reason the landmarks of a person's life are fixed by our confession of faith in God's Word is because God has given us a free will to choose our own destiny. Amen. You're the author, you, you are in authority in your life. Jesus said, you will have what you say. Yes, yeah. Mark 11, 23. Isn't that right? Yes, Your words are significant to the outcome of the circumstances of life. Your words carry significance. Yes. Amen. 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 Uh, there are different things you can put your words to. You can put them to what the doctor says. You can put them to what the lawyer says, or what the banker says, or what somebody says. But, but you don't have to be limited. To, you don't have to put your words to things other people in the natural say. Uh, <laughs> anything you put words to now becomes significant when you say it it becomes significant and here's the reason why because God has given you authority in your life in other words our words put things in motion our words can bind us they can restrain us or they can set us free you understand the words that we speak do that they put spiritual forces in motion because they carry authority Psalm 103 20 says our words set angels in motion 
1 Corinthians 10.10 said the words of the Israelites uh, gave place to the destroyer. That's the power of darkness. Words open the door to the devil, open the door to God, depending on what we say. God and Satan are waiting for what we're going to say to determine whether they have authority to do things in our lives. We invite them or uh, reject them with our words. Remember, whatever you bind is bound. Whatever you loose is loose. He didn't say whatever God binds and loose. He said whatever you bind and loose. How do we bind and loose? By saying things. By saying things, God is the right things God is loosed in our life. By saying the wrong things, Satan is loosed and God is bound. Amen. Our words carry authority. Our words are an invitation to God. They, they, they open the door to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. You getting this? But many people don't believe that because they've been, they've been taught the sovereignty doctrine. But no, the Bible says it's very plain. Uh, I like some things that the Bible says in Psalm 6, I mean, uh, uh, Proverbs 6 and Proverbs 12. It says, uh, it talks there in Proverbs 6 and 12. There's two different verses. One, one uh, uh, passage there says, you are uh, uh, bound by the words of your lips. Bound by the words of your lips. In other words, you can only go so far because you only talk so far. If the doctor says only six months and you start talking six months Come on. Yeah. Come to live, yes, sir. your words seal that. Yes, sir. Your words seal that. Yes, sir. I told you the story of the, uh, Brother Hagin actually told the story of the man that he was invited to uh, a family that they, they, they kind of knew personally. That Hagen's knew personally. Brother Hagen was invited to the hospital room of one of their sons who had been admitted to the hospital, I believe at 39 years old, if I remember right, who had uh, suddenly gone into a coma. And they asked the family, the friends of the Hagen's, asked if Brother Hagen would come and minister to the young the man and, uh, and uh, minister healing to him. He had fallen into a coma. Brother Hagen went into the room to lay hands on, the, in the hospital room to lay hands on him and he put his hand on him, and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to him and said, Spiritual laws have been set in motion and cannot be reversed at this time. Release his spirit and let him come on home. Well, you can do all the praying, all the spitting and sputtering and crying and pounding the floor you want after God speaks like that, and it's not going to change anything. And so Brother Hagin did exactly what the Lord said, and they, the family said, well, what did the Lord say? Because the Lord didn't say it audibly. You know, he said it to Brother Hagin. And, uh, and Brother Hagin said, well, the Lord said spiritual laws have been set in motion and can't be reversed at this time. Let us release his spirit let him come on home. And within a short time, the man died. Well, later they told him what, that, what Brother Hagin didn't know in the natural. The Lord had told him by revelation of the Spirit. But later the family told him, told Brother Hagin, what that meant and what spiritual laws that man had set in motion. And I actually met the brother of the man who died, who was a pastor in uh, La Salle, Peru. You ever heard, remember us telling about La Salle, Peru? Now, there was another pastor there whenever the man was raised from the dead there in La Salle. We were ministering there. But, but uh, this man was another new pastor, uh, and his name was Pastor Tom Arnold. He's the brother of the, uh, the man that died, the friends of the Hagans and and that young man died. And so whenever I found that out, I said, tell me that story. I want to hear that story. He said, well, we were, we, his brother and him were close in age. He said around, I don't know, 15 or young, young, young age anyway. He said, we'd be playing, horsing around, goofing off, doing whatever we were doing. And he said, every now and then my brother would just stop, just stop with a serious look on his face. I have no doubt an imp, a little demon, put a thought in his mind. And he would stop and he said, you know, I'll never live to see the age of 40. And then he would get to playing again and messing around, goofing off. And, and uh, my, uh, Tom Arnold, the friend, that, the pastor that I met, was his brother, said that would happen from time to time. He'd just start saying that. You know, I'll never live to see the age of 40. Well, you hear what the Lord said to Brother Hagin. Spiritual laws. Spiritual laws. That's what we're talking about this morning, spiritual laws. The law of faith. He said spiritual laws have been set in motion. Now, he set it in motion against him. What if you set it in motion for you? Doctor said, you're not going to live past the age of 40. I say and declare, with long life, he'll satisfy me and show me his salvation. 
power goes into action. Spiritual laws start moving that and causing it to come to pass. I believe it as deep as I can on the inside. And that's why I don't say some of the things some people say. Stop talking about your flu. Your bursitis, your cancer, your arthritis, your, your, your. Yours were laid on him. If yours were laid on him, what is coming against you is not yours. <laughs> Whoa, glory to, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. But that man said for, for all those years, I don't remember at the age he started. Maybe I'm just saying somewhere around 15. I remember it was young. His brother said it was young. And what, how many years there he said that, you know, I'll never live to see the age of 40. I'll never live past the age of 40. He gets to 39, falls into a coma, and Brother Hagin tries to minister to him. The Lord said, I can't, I, I can't reverse spiritual laws. That he's. Somebody said the Lord wouldn't heal him. No, he blocked the Lord. The Lord wanted to. It's like Jesus in his own hometown. He could there do no mighty work. It didn't say he didn't want to. It said he couldn't. In other words, he came wanting to do there what he had done everywhere else, but there he couldn't. I know people don't believe that's in the Bible, but look it up on your way home. Mark 6. He could there do no might. Aren't you glad it said there and not everywhere? In my life, you're invited to freely work. In my life, you, the door is wide open to you. In my life, there's room. I got my mouth open wide. I'm making room for you to come in and do exceedingly, abundantly, above all I can ask or think. Marvel signs and wonders. Pray, stand with me to your feet. Stand with me to your feet. Stand with me to your feet. Let's take the limiters off. What do you say? Let's take the limiters off. You speak poverty words, and that's what you're going to have is poverty. I speak rich words. I say he daily loads me with benefits. I say he supplies all my needs. He gives, he gives me richly all things to enjoy. I give, and it's given back unto me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and what? Running over. That's, that's, uh, beyond, uh, that's beyond what I need, the running over part. <laughs> Hallelujah. The psalmist said, my cup runneth over. And so he says, I'm going to keep saying running over. Running over. My cup runneth over runs over the top of what he can contain. You know, God's always able to do beyond what you can contain. But here's the thing. You'll only be able to enjoy what you can contain. What that running over part, you can't keep it. It's, it's, it's more than you can, that more than you can, that more than you've made room for. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Preach myself happy, happy, happy. Happy. 